Well, good morning, Merlin. It's great to be here with you today. My name is Corey Bielek. I'm Executive Vice President and CEO of Kanalaski Uranium. I'm joined here today by Mr. Nathan Bridge, my Vice President of Exploration with Kanalaska. Kanalaska, it's a junior explorer. We pride ourselves on a hybrid uh, model of project generation and exploration. We generate a lot of projects. We explore the projects that fit our mandate and that we see uh, potential in. And um, yeah, we're, we're really happy to be here with you today and uh, talk a little bit about a little bit more about the company. Corey, Nathan, uh, good to have you both on the show. Uh, Corey, thank you for the introduction. That's great. Um, <clears throat> so, Can Alaska, you've had a pretty exciting uh, year last year, and um, you are focused on uranium, but you've got some nickel and copper projects as well. Uh, can we talk about those later, but let's just stick with uranium for now. Can you just give a quick summary, Corey, perhaps, um, of the Come to discoveries that were made last year and where you got in your thinking last year and what you'd be looking at just at kind of high level terms um, for this year. Oh, absolutely, Merlin. We had a fantastic 2021. We were very active throughout our portfolio in both uranium and nickel space, but in particular uranium. Uh, we drilled brand new polymetallic mineralization of Waterbury South project early in 2021. We moved that success through to to the summer where we drilled additional high-grade mineralization or water, our West MacArthur project, uh, building on the 42 zone discovery we've been working on for a couple of years and actually expanding the target area to the Southwest by about three kilometers. We had a lot of success at West MacArthur. Our new joint venture with Denison Mines that our Moon Lake South project intersected two new areas of mineralization along a four or five kilometer trend. So now there's three zones of mineralization already identified on the Moon Lake South project. And again, that's a brand new joint venture with Denison. Fantastic results coming from that project. And now we're doing deals and we're staking land and we're increasing our portfolio in that project generator space, um, you know, late, late in the year, all moving towards what we're going to do in 2022. And that's going to continue to move Waterbury South forward, our West MacArthur project forward. We're going to be uh, working on a new project on a deal that we did last year, later in, in 2022 at our key extension project, just very close to the Key Lake mine. So we're... Um, we're poised for 2022 and having a lot of fun. Um, excellent. Can I? Um, it's also uh, exciting. I need a map to um, get my head around it. <laughs> I'm relatively new to the Athabasca Basin, so you're going to have to uh, go gently with me. Oh, Nathan, thank you. Um, right. So let's just pull that up and unpack that a bit. So there you are um, in the Athabasca. So can you just remind me, just, just taking it really slowly, because I'm, I'm relatively new to the story. So West MacArthur, you've got this joint venture with Cameco. That's right, yeah? Can you just, um, Nathan, I can see, I think I can see your mouth if, it mouths if you move, move it around. Can you just outline the, um, your percentage ownership and, and what, how, the nature of that joint venture? I mean, do, do you fund it or do, uh, is, is, is Cameco funding that one? Yeah, so our West MacArthur project located uh, here, it's in the eastern Athabasca. Uh, that's a joint venture with, with Cameco, as you, you mentioned there, Merlin. Uh, ownership right now is about 75% uh, Can Alaska, 25% Cameco. Um, we, uh, we, we took the project back from Cameco a couple of years ago uh, after they earned it under an option agreement. Uh, and then uh, we've been operating it since. Um, we, uh, we're planning our program there, as Corey mentioned, next year uh, for 2022. Um, Cameco is not funding that program. Um, they have their, their, exploration, uh, uh, their own exploration um, uh, ideas to target. Uh, they're an active partner, though. Uh, even though they're not funding, uh, we still have a great technical relationship with them. We, uh, we have our joint venture technical meetings, and, uh, and they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they support the work we're doing, uh, but have chosen not to fund it at this time. Okay, so, so you've got 75% of Waterbury and you're funding it. And um, sorry, of, of West MacArthur. Waterbury yeah. is, is 100% yours. Can you just point that one out? Yeah, so our Waterbury claims, so we have the Waterbury East and Waterbury South. Uh, they're located uh, just a little bit further north. Uh, our Waterbury South claim, the one that Corey mentioned, is the one that we're really focused on. And what you can see here, uh, it's located quite close to Cigar Lake, which is which is obviously important. Um, so the Cigar Lake mine, uh, chemical... Uh, uh, produces uh, pretty much all the uranium out of that mine uh, right now. Uh, and and we, uh, we went into Waterbury South last year, uh, had a couple holes that we drilled, got some really interesting results. Uh, and so the team uh, is very excited about that to get back into Waterbury South for this year. Again, 100% owned. Um, so we're funding that entire program. Uh, that'll be uh, the focus for our winter here. 
for, for our team. Uh, when you say winter, is that up until April or? Yeah, yeah. So we actually, the team's on the ground right now. Uh, the drill is turning. Um, things are, are going well. Um, we were expecting uh, to be in there for, for two to three months. Uh, again, you know, really results dependent. Uh, the results are what drive uh, drive how we explore that property. So I'll get into a little bit more detail on it here. Uh, but yeah, we, we expect a couple months of activity at, at a water break. Great. And, and the third one you mentioned, Corey, was Denison. Um, sorry, the Moon Lake South project with Denison. What's the, what's the nature of the JV there and kind of how's the funding structure work there? So the nature of the JV with Denison is that we're uh, 25% ownership. So they earned in 75%. Now it's a co-funding joint venture with Denison. They're leading the project. Um, they'll propose the programs and budget and um, they're proposing a, a program for this year as well. Uh, not drilling, but preparation for the next drilling phase probably uh, probably in the next year. So yeah, prepping that project for a bit of a bit of a better program moving forward or bigger program moving forward with the drills. So yeah, really encouraging results out of that project right near the Griffin, their Griffin deposit uh, on the Wheeler River project. So we're pretty excited about the results. And that was, that was one of your kind of, um, you put the plan together, you put the, the hypothesis together did the early work and then they've earned it on that. Absolutely. Yeah. They recognize the potential. Uh, we did a deal with them. I think it was 2016 uh, over the no- la- last number of years, they've earned into that 75% ownership and now they're operator of the project, but we're a co-funding 25% and the results obviously dictate that we should continue to fund that program because it's, uh, it's generating results in our exploration. So it's fantastic news for us. Right at the top, you said you're project generator. So, so your, your USP is kind of knowing the geology and, targeting new ground um, and you've got the Cree area, um, Cree area east or Cree east. Um, what pedigree, not, not, not in any kind of dismissive way, but you know, what gives you the kind of the insight into the geology? What's kind of the experience base up there in the Athabasca? You know, could, could you talk a bit about that and, and how you go about the process of targeting new areas? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question, Merlin. So uh, I think for me, you know, uh, being new to Can Alaska here in the last six months, uh, one of the reasons I came over was was that project generator model and, and the way that Can Alaska has been able to do it in the past. You know, having been on the other side of the table working at Cameco, I was uh, part of that West MacArthur uh, joint venture uh, when it was formed, and and just saw how that that project generator model works. And you know, I think an important piece of that is it's the technical team. Uh, it's the people that we have that are that are working on on these projects and trying to um, to find these new opportunities and these new ideas. Um, the Athabasca Basin, really, it's there's there's no other place like it in the world when you're exploring for uranium. So um, that that helps. Uh, that makes it a little easier. But it's it's the fundamentals. It's you know just understanding how these deposits form. Um, where they where they're likely to form, and then and going out and looking and see if, if we can find the the property and the um, and then bringing in the partners to help us operate those. So you know we we have Denison uh, as a partner right now, at Cameco on our our West MacArthur joint venture. In the past, um, worked with the with the Koreans um, on our our Cree East uh, project, and um, you know just just finding the right partners to come in and work. Um, I think it really helps us drive that model forward. Thank you, Nathan. That's that's um, a really interesting background that you've come from uh, Cameco and your, your kind of um, poacher or gamekeeper term poacher, perhaps is the um, is the phrase. Um, could you? Uh, I, when I look through your deck, I really I really like that slide. Slide. Um, I think it's in slide eleven on the deck, uh, which looked at the basin and different kind of um, mineralization types. And it's, it says that from 2005, you've um, had a new way of looking at the basin and looking at new geophysical techniques, new tools. I wonder, can you bring that slide up and perhaps talk me through it? Because I'd like to kind of unpack that a bit. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is the slide you're referring to here, Merlin. So, um, you know, what we're really trying to show here is that at Can Alaska, we've, we've got opportunities that span all different uh, styles and, and depths of, of uh, deposits. So uh, we have our shallow targets. So Northeast Walston we're in, and our key extension project that Corey mentioned, uh, we're looking at basement targets. These targets are near the surface, uh, hosted in the basement rocks. They're, they're not, uh, they're, 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 they're unconformity deposits, but we're looking at really those basement roots of these unconformity deposits. Um, you know, the so, reason sorry, we're interested in, sorry, sorry. So, um, so that Northeast Wollaston, those basement targets, these are in new areas that you're putting claims in or you're applying for mineral title. You're not, yeah, you're not, yeah, so, you're, you're not drilling on them. It's just early stage, hype, um, kind of theoretical targeting. Yeah. So Northeast Wollaston, really the targeting for, for these basement hosted deposits, it's, it's driven by a lot of the, uh, 
the Eagle Point, and, uh, which is a deposit there uh, near Northeast Walson, but also the Arrow deposit. Um, I mean, Arrow is fairly well known in the basin, extremely high grades, uh, extremely rich deposit. And really, um, what we find with these basement targets is that they're often underexplored. The unconformity targets, so say the mid-depth and the deep ones, are the, are the targets that people have went after for 60 years of exploring through the basin. That's the classic model. Um, these basement deposits are a little bit trickier to find in the sense that um, they're structurally controlled uh, below that sandstone. They don't have uh, as significant of a, uh, you know, an alteration halo because they don't have the, that clean sandstone above them that allows these, these alteration halos to form. Uh, so they're a little bit trickier, but really the, it's the prize with these ones that the, you know, when you can get into a system on, on some of these basement targets, that, like we know with Arrow and like we know with Eagle Point, they can be quite large uh, and they can be quite high grade. So really the, there's significant value there in being able to explore for these. Do you use, um, I, mean, I can see that it's mapped under um, glacial till. Can you use any geochemical surveys, um, you know, any geochemistry techniques or is this a geophysical um, story or uh, is this blind? Uh, do you ever get outcrop? You know, what's your exploration tool for actually locating those? Yeah, so in some areas you do get outcrop. Uh, so for example, our, our key extension uh, properties in the south part of the basin, there's there's potential that we could find some outcrop. But, you know, historically, if, if there is outcrop associated with these, it, those discoveries are long made. Um, you know, the Key Lake deposits is a good example where, uh, you know, they, they, they can, they can um, they, they would have, people have walked the ground, so they would have seen these things already. Um, for us, the focus on these, these basement targets is really the geophysical signature. It's what we see from, uh, from Arrow, from Eagle Point, from these large basement deposits, we're looking at a gravity signature and an EM signature that, that couples with it. So really, what we want to see is a gravity low. You know, that gravity low is interpreted it, to be mapping the alteration of those basement rocks. And then that EM signal with it, that EM signal is imaging that conductive uh, host lithology. So when you couple those together, those are the ideal targets that we're looking for when it comes to these basement hosted targets. You say the host lithology, it, as in in the structure. So it's it's lithification. Oh, hang on, that would be a reason. Um, that's unlikely to be. Too, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so what is it? Is there a sulfide um, introduced? You know, what's the? Was it just the fluid in the fracture? What's the conductor? Your... Yeah, so the conductor in this in in the typical Athabasca deposits would be the graphitic uh, meta sediments. So what we're imaging there is the meta sediments, and these graphitic lithologies are often uh, more malleable than say the the harder Archean rocks that are that are also located there in the full crust belt. So um, what happens is those graphitic lithologies are easier to disrupt. So that structural disruption, that constant post post Athabasca reactivation of these uh, graphitic lithologies is what allows the fluids to move both up into the, the sandstone basin and down into these, these basement hosted deposits. Surely you're not the only group looking at this. How do, how do you, yeah. um, you know, it, it, this is, uh, you know, the arrow discovery is next gen, great value creation. So Absolutely. how do you create, or how do you secure title on, how do you, how do you pick up the ground? I mean, what's, if you're a project generator, how do you actually get, you know, you have, you might have the theory, but how do you get to the stage where you actually put the claims in? Yeah, so our Northeast Walson is a great example. Um, it, as you probably know about the basin here, the activity was down uh, quite substantially over the last 10 years. It wasn't a lot of new staking, a lot of new activity. Uh, there was some great discoveries in that time, but, you know, there's, there wasn't a lot of uh, players outside of the, you know, those key, say, 10 to 12, 15 companies that, that, that stuck through it through the hard times. Uh, and, and during that time, what, what we were able to do is we were able to amass a land portfolio, you know, up in the northeast part of the basin there uh, around the Eagle Point deposits where we think we see the extension of that fault uh, moving out to the northeast. So we were able to go in and we picked the land that we wanted and the spots where we saw the uh, in those surveys, the, the features that we were looking for. Our key extension project is a little bit different. Uh, key extension is uh, is the project that I'm really excited about. Um, and Corey mentioned you, it, it. Key extension, you'd say, not Cree. Key. Yeah. Can, can so you pop key, the map up? Can you pop yeah, the map up so I, can, so I can kind of under, understand where it is again? I'm. I'm. Oh, this guy. I, I. I. I learned through repetition. So. Um. <laughs> Absolutely. So our key extension project. So uh, this is a great map here for for key extension. So uh, as Corey mentioned, um, we we uh, did a deal on this project um, in uh, September of this year. And the reason we're, we're really excited about this project is you can see on the, the map on the left here, you see the Dealman, Gardner, Gax, and the BV pit. So, 
So these are the key lake deposits. Historically mined, over 150 million pounds of uranium came out of key lake deposits. And what we believe is that the, the key lake fault, uh, based on the geophysical data that we have for the area, actually trends onto the key extension uh, claims, which are highlighted in red there. And what's also important there is if you, if you can kind of look, you can see that we've got the Walston majadic transition zone highlighted here. The Walston majadic transition is a very important structural uh, uh, crustal transition zone in the, in the Athabasca Basin where we go from the Wallston rocks to the Majadic rocks. And this, this transition zone basically runs the entire Eastern Athabasca all the way up through Phoenix, MacArthur River, up to Cigar Lake uh, and to Eagle Point deposits in the North. It's, it's been explored, um, uh, you know, for, for decades, but what really got us excited. To... So sorry, is that a, is that a, is that a structural domain? Is, is that, is that the definition or is it a time boundary of kind of deposition or is it, is it in a, a structural corridor or a um yeah yeah or, a, or a stratigraphic or, or a stratigraphic corridor no a large a large structural corridor yeah where you've got these two domains uh, up against each other yeah um thank you so um what, you know what what really gets us excited about key lake though our key sorry our key extension project um you know we believe we have the key lake fault trending onto our property that's great um but the other piece is that this, this property has actually never been drilled. Uh, so we're, you know, 15 kilometers away from one of the earliest discoveries in the Athabasca Basin. We don't have a single drill hole into the project. And to me, that's, that's really exciting. We have no sandstone cover. Uh, so we're looking at these basement targets here. Uh, and, you know, I think uh, it, it's not often you find a project, you know, this close to one of the mills in the Athabasca that, that doesn't have any drill holes into it, that, that really hasn't, hasn't been tested at all. So, um, you know, that's what gets me really excited about, about this project here. And those four mines, those four pits that you've highlighted there from Gelman down to BV. Yeah. Were they open pits on basement structures? Yeah. So Gartner and uh, Dillman um, were open pits. Um, BV and Gax, I can't recall. I don't, I don't think BV and Gax ever, ever got mined. Uh, it's Gartner and Dielman pits that produced 150 million pounds of uranium. Both open pits now, um, I believe, serve as tailings facilities for, for chemicals operations. Um, but yeah, they're basically there. You've got uh, just, just a few meters of sandstone cover on those projects. So um, once you move a little bit further to the west, we're outside of the basin. And they, they mined material in, this, in, the, in the vaults. They mined basement material in, in one of these um, basement structures. Yeah, so these are classic unconformity right where that, the, basically that basement structure intersects the unconformities where Gartner and Dielman were deposited. These two deposits were really the, you know, in my mind, kind of the, the fundamental drivers on that unconformity model. Pretty well all exploration in the basin has been based essentially off these, you know, with the combination of Rabbit Lake in the north. But um, yeah, these, these two, two deposits were really the start of the, the exploration in the Athabasca Basin. Sorry, can we go back to that other slide, you know, the slide yeah. 11 with the, um, um, while, while you're shifting there, can you uh, just, um, okay, great. So could you just kind of point to them um, on, on here, where, what are you targeting? Is it, the, the, would you say that those Key Lake extensions are the equivalent of the Northeast Wollaston? I mean, can you, can you show me with your mouse roughly? What yeah, so when, when we're talking about, you know, the, um, the key lake deposits, we'd be looking at deposits that would kind of form in this area, say around the Sue A to be a little bit less sandstone cover than, than okay. Sue A to be. But basically, you've got your crystalline basement, you've got your Athabasca sandstone. These deposits are forming right where that structure hits that, that target. Um, oftentimes, what we, what we see, um, and we look at examples like Eagle Point, you will get these zones at the unconformity, but then they often have basement roots. And that's really what we're looking at here is for a long strike of these deposits. So we're looking for now, we're shifting over here and looking for these basement roots that go with these unconformity bodies. And I think and Merlin, that, 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 that's a key point because what we've learned in the last 15 years about Eagle Point or Arrow is that these deposits can go down up to a kilometer, as we know it today, below that unconformity. And we know that the Athabasca Basin extended for, you know, 100, 100 kilometers out from its margins at the time of ore formation here, 1.6 billion years ago. So what's really important to understand is that there's probably 800 meters of target depth below that unconformity contact around the margins of the basin. So that hasn't been explored for. 
certainly not adequately. And now that we know a lot more about Eagle Point or Arrow in the last 10 or 15 years, we've strategically gone out and selected areas that fit that model outside the basin margins for our Northeast Wallston Key Extension project. So we're pretty excited about the opportunity that's in front of us in relatively underexplored terrain. So if I understand that right, you're saying that the, the basin was um, has been eroded, but it did extend, but it's been, let's say it's been eroded over here. And so this bit is missing, but you've got the fault coming up underneath, which was still mineralized and it had sandstone above it at one stage, but now no longer does. Correct, Merlin. Correct. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm beginning, beginning to understand it. So you've got those targets. You've got the um, Cree East, which was the, the, the mid-tier ones, and you've got the, the deeper ones with MacArthur. So you've got quite a busy, um, um, you've got quite a busy year coming up. You, um, as, as I can see, you've got four um, uranium drilling programs and two on nickel. Can we just, um, for, for my benefit, talk about the, the halo using nickel as a vector for uranium mineralization and is the nickel in its own right an economic target or are you just using it as a vector and remind me which project that's on that's the trouble with project generators is, is you've got so many projects that's um it's, yeah. it's a, a mission to yeah, try and remember absolutely. where they all are yeah so the the that's a great project that um you know we're really excited in that that's that's our water break self project and so basically um Last year, uh, Can Alaska team drilled a couple holes in this project and we intersected polymetallic mineralization. Now that's not um, uncommon in these deposits. What we know about these classic unconformity deposits like you know, Cigar Lake, uh, Midwest, Fox Lake, all these large uh, unconformity deposits, they have a lot of nickel uh, associated with them. That's a, just a, a function of the chemistry when these deposits are forming that the, the nickel, uh, it, it comes along with the uranium and the fluid, it drops out in similar conditions. And therefore, you form these, these nickel sulfides. Now, typically, uh, what we know from, from these other unconformity deposits is that these nickel sulfides are typically along the fringes of the deposits. They're not often in the heart of the deposit. And that's really just a function of the chemistry changing as, as the fluids are dropping out the, the mineralization. Uh, so when we see results like this, we see 400 ppm uranium. But what gets us really excited is that 2% nickel. That 2% nickel typically occurs along the fringes. Uh, look, for example, at, at Hurricane, uh, ISO Energy's uh, uh, recent discovery. If you look at the, the numbers that they're releasing in their press releases, they're releasing nickel grades that are up in that two to three percent range. That gets us really encouraged. So we 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 believe that we're into the system here. Uh, we're seeing the zonation of the metals. Now the key here, and the, really the purpose of our program that that we're we're undertaking uh, right now, is to go out and find out where we are in that system. You know, these are these are chemically controlled deposits. So. We need to understand what direction we need to go from these results and, and our team's on the ground doing that uh, as we speak. Great. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, what is the depth to that unconformity? I can't see just, just because the resolution of the screen isn't good enough. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're about 200 to 300 across this property. So fairly shallow. We would consider that, say, in our mid-tier. A little bit of sandstone cover, which is great. Uh, it generates, you can see these, these alteration halos. It generates the alteration halos. That's great. Uh, it gives us a, a medium to vector on, um, but not so deep that, that it takes you know two weeks to test your target. We can we can test these targets fairly efficiently. And, um, and do you, are you diamond drilling? Yeah, yeah, all diamond drilling. So we case, we would case okay. off that overburden at the top, and then and all diamond drilling yeah, down to the uh, top to bottom. Okay, and the that the alteration zone that you've marked in yellow, though the dotted line around the outside. Um, and it, that's never of a high enough grade to fall into kind of an economic contribu contribution um, category, is it? A question mark. Yeah, yeah. So what these what these alterations? And I mean, you see the the word bleaching used a lot, uh, pretty well elsewhere. So essentially, uh, your basin was a uh, red bed sandstones. That bleaching is essentially removing that diagenetic hematite, and that that occurs from secondary processes. So once these faults interact with the unconformity. They expel fluids uh, through the sandstone basin, and, and that's really what you're picking up is kind of that uh, ground prep signature from, from these uh, alteration events that are pre and, and, and post uh, mineralization. Um, the bleaching is one that, that's very common. One that really gets us excited, though, is we covered it up a little bit here with our arrow, but you can see the pyrite alteration. The pyrite alteration is really uh, where you're seeing that the, the fluids are coming from that mineralizing process. So you, you can bleach the sandstone without, you know, 
having uh, mineralizing fluids per se, but when you get that pyrite in, again, that's the, that's a chemical reaction that's very similar to the reactions that form the uranium deposits. So having that that gray pyrite throughout the sandstone is a really strong indication of the 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 chemistry of these fluids that are moving around and their potential to to host uranium. I like the way the um, the fractures can refract through the different competency rocks. You've got them kind of relatively yeah. low angle in the basement yeah. and then they, they steepen in the, in the overburden. That's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So now you call it a polymetallic discovery, which makes me think that the nickel and the, potentially the zinc and potentially the cobalt will be economic contributors. Can, do you have any other diagrams of that kind of little zoomed in on that? Or are we, is, this the, is this the section we're dealing with at the moment? Yeah, so this this is the one that that we're uh, we're dealing with here at the moment. Um, you know, typically uh, in the basin, uh, these other metals aren't mined. Um, typically, the focus is uranium. The reason for that is the uranium grades are just they're just so significant um, that they they dominate the system. Um, it, it's polymetallic mineralization in the sense that that uh, it, really any classic unconformity deposit it, it hosts polymetallic mineralization. Um, uh, from our perspective, uh, those are important vectors. Um, you know, from a processing perspective, that would be, uh, I guess, for some of the bigger guys to, to figure out the value in this. Good. Great. I'm, 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 kind of, I'm, I'm getting into the weeds here, but it's really interesting um, hearing about the, the way that you kind of target these things and you, and you, um, you vector in on that mineralization. So just you're drilling Waterbury South at the moment. And am yeah. I right in thinking, OK, so, so th that's going on at the moment. That's the winter program. Yeah. Um, how is that going, um, Corey? Perhaps can you talk about kind of what your plans are? What are you hoping to get out of this program? You might have mentioned this before, but um, if you could repeat it for me, that'd be great. Yeah, for Waterbury South, where we're drilling right now, it, it, as Nathan mentioned, we're looking at where, where are we in that system? We know that these polymetallic systems, half of the Athabasca deposits, like Cigar Lake, the Key Lake deposits, 2.5% average grade nickel. Lots of arsenic, uh, same, same at Cigar Lake, Midwest. There's this, about half of them look like this Waterbury South alteration system that we're in. So we believe we're onto a, a really large mineralizing event. So the trick is finding where to go within that system to find where the uranium drops out because they're zoned. And that's the challenge here is we don't know which direction to go yet. So this program will hopefully start to answer that. We know we're into a big alteration system. Where do we need to be to find the uranium associated with what we're seeing in the nickel and arsenic and cobalt that we've already intersected in, in uh, 2021? So that's a driver for this program. It'd be great if we find that with this one, but trying to figure out where to go is one of the first steps here. And we're working on that right now. So the success Early success would be going, yes, we need to go west, we need to go east, maybe both directions, but we know that we're on a fertile fault. Where does that fertile fault go? Okay, so getting a good structural orientation on that and understanding its, its um, complexities is critical for the first steps here in this program. Does that mean you're putting in kind of a couple of fences of holes with um, um, you know, two holes on each, on, a, on each section? And do you, are you moving south and north or east and west along your... Your, your faults at 50 meter intervals or what are your step outs? Yeah, so correct. So, so finish the section first, you know, really understand which structure we need to be on because there's multiple structures in this, uh, in this area. And then stepping out from that, it could be 50 meters, could be 100. It's going to be dictated by what we see in that first hole and then uh, work from there. So as you know, we need to get off of that section to really understand where the fault is going. So that's the next critical step. What is the orientation of structure? Because these deposits don't form without these big faults. So we need to figure out where the fault is going, then we can use that in both directions to figure out where we need to be within this system. So, so you, yeah. You, you had one discovery hole in it last year, is that, am I correct? Correct. So you're gonna put in a hole underneath it, presumably? The first hole will be over top of it because oh. we're testing the structure at that unconformity. We really hit it down in the basement. Okay. Uh, so we're testing that at the unconformity, that ideal target for these unconformity deposits. Again, the change in rock and then moving outward on strike to that, depending on results. So it's going to be results driven. Follow our nose. You can triangulate from the depth that you cross the, the, the unconformity to the depth of the structure. You can work out what Correct. the step out has to be. Um, what, what's the, how, how far below the um, unconformity do you think you hit the structure in your first hole? I believe we're down yeah. 
about 80 meters. Sorry, Nathan. I think we're down around 80 meters below the unconformity, if I recall correctly. So we've got a long ways to go to the unconformity, a long ways in, in, uh, in the sense of testing it. But you can use that to sort of pinpoint where we need to be, and, and that's what we're doing. Okay, great. And when you say you're following your nose, have you... What kind of drill program have you got? Have you got a five hole program? Have you got the capacity to do a seven or a nine hole program? You know, what's your, what's your flex here? Yeah, I, it's a great question, Merlin, because I think it, it really depends um, on the results, but you know, from a, a permits and access perspective, we're fully permitted. We can do, uh, I think upwards of 40 holes if we really, really got into some, you know, really interesting uh, mineralization here, which would be a, a fantastic problem uh, for yeah. us to have. Um, I think I think uh, the focus, as Corey mentioned here, is it's a few holes to really understand the structure, the way things are going. Are we seeing upgrading? Whether we, you know, when we step east or west, is the bulk getting larger? Are we seeing more alteration? Those are the drivers. So, um, no, we're we're limited obviously by time. Um, so we we pretty well in this this part of the world, beginning of April, you pretty well have to turn the drill off for a couple of months. So. You know, our hope is to get a couple of those fences done and really see where those results lead us. So a couple of fences plus the one you're doing, so that's more or less five holes in this in the, in, as the first shout. Yeah, I think that would be a good target for us this year. Yeah. Okay, great. Now let's talk about the Manitoba nickel project because I see that you're drilling that February to April and then potentially from May onwards, which would mean May to September, which means that's kind of a results-driven, success-driven um, program. So um, we haven't spoken about nickel. Perhaps you could just tell me a little bit about that project and um, what you're hoping to find and what would take you on to the second phase of the drilling program. Yeah. So our, our Manabridge project um, is actually uh, currently under option. So um, the, the nickel story here, we have uh, a lot of property in the Thompson Nickel Belt, uh, significant land holding. Um, one of those is, is the Manabridge deposit, uh, historically producing uh, a mine. The, the project's currently subject to an earn-in with Metal Energy. So it's a $4 million earn-in. Uh, Metal Energy is buying in for up to uh, um, 100% of the project, uh, which would leave us with a, a royalty on the back end if it proceeds that far. Uh, so uh, under this agreement, though, uh, we're the operators uh, here for this, this program coming up in Q1. Uh, the focus on this program, again, it's really it's driven by Metal Energy. It's driven by, by their goals. Um, you know, and, and how they want to advance this project. But the focus uh, for us here this year is is some historic drilling, uh, sorry, confirming some of the historic drilling uh, around the deposit, you know, in in uh, helping them advance that to that 43101 stage, um, as well as uh, understanding some of the controls. So um, they've done some great work looking at the, the, uh, the 3D model for the area and understanding the controls on these deposits. And and so we'll go in and try to test some of these these ideas that uh, that there's some you know some plunge or some rake to this system and and, and can we see that and um, you know can we upgrade the, the potential as a result of that so again they're really they're driving the program uh, we're we're operating it for and 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 you know having these technical discussions uh, where it goes past um, Q1 of this year really depends uh, on, on results and on on what Metal Energy uh, wants to do what their focus is and, and the four million dollars is that spent on the ground or is that cash you know is, is an element of cash to you in that process yeah there's a mixture of cash Merlin and shares in three stages so the first stage they have to spend uh, you know five hundred thousand in the ground the next stage is one point five million to uh, to earn uh, I believe eighty percent and then to get to the full hundred percent ownership with Ken Alaska getting a royalty they have to spend upward of four million so. We like to put money in the ground because that gives the opportunity for our shareholders to, you know, get that discovery. A um, little bit of cash to cover some of the costs uh, and upside, some shares for the upside, obviously. But really, it's about for us doing deals to get money into the ground. And I think that's a consistent pattern we've shown is to make sure that we're, we're backstop with royalties or residual interest or both but getting that exploration into the ground because that's how you make discoveries. It's not taking a little bit of money or, or a little bit of cash or, or shares, sorry. It's about getting money in the ground to explore because you only find it with a drill hole. And that's, uh, that's the way we approach it. Absolutely. You don't, you don't um, find mineral deposits by sitting on your butt in London or in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> or Saskatoon. Or, Sask or Saskatoon. Um, great. Um, well, I guess um, that leads me to the kind of the question is how do you value can I ask you? Yeah, can you just talk to me a little bit about, about the building blocks of value? Um, I've I've got my, um, you know, I always think of a kind of a, a, an economic uranium deposit. It's kind of nudge, It's got to be nudging that fifty million pound um, contained metal. It's it's a kind of a doesn't hold fast and true in every situation, but it's kind of a yardstick. Um, 
so how do you uh, how, how do you kind of intellectualize how do you kind of see the value blocks of can alaska given that you've got a market cap of 42 million canadian at the moment yeah correct so uh, and it's come off substantially in the last uh, last number of weeks but you know that's that's amongst our peers the same it's just a market issue but you know we have a portfolio that is second to none merlin i mean uh, and and it's not just land that we're holding it's Four projects responding to active exploration at Cree East, West MacArthur, uh, Waterbury South, or Moon Lake South Joint Venture with Denison. Every one of those projects in the last number of years have responded to our exploration effort. That's second to none in the basin, even among the majors. Our projects are responding to our exploration efforts. So that tells us we're in the right geological space. The new projects that we're picking up, again, very focused on the model on the models that have been overlooked, like at Cree Extension or Northeast Walston, looking for those basement models that really haven't been truly tested. So there's a lot of upside value in that part of the portfolio, that being the project generation side. So it's really built around the uranium space and being around the critical infrastructure that Arano and Kamika own in the Eastern Athabasca. I mean, our projects are right up against theirs. They're right, you know, 12 kilometers away from the MacArthur River mine. They're 10 kilometers away from the Key Lake Mill. I mean, we've strategically positioned our shareholders with assets that upon discovery have a leg up to getting into the mill, getting mined into the mill and realization of that, uh, that value. So, you know, we've been very strategic about where we position ourselves in the Eastern Athabasca in particular, driving that value in this next cycle that we believe is right in front of us that will value these projects quite a bit higher than perhaps some of our peers. So geologically correct, uh, situationally correct, that being the infrastructure, and also waiting for that market to turn. And we believe it's turning in the uranium space. Now, what did we do during the low period in uranium? We went out and we developed this incredible nickel portfolio in the fifth largest nickel belt on the planet, historically, the Thompson Nickel Belt. Again, largely, un largely ignored in the downturn for nickel. Land came open. We saw the opportunity. We went and picked it up strategically, just like we did in the uranium space. And we built a portfolio of exploration properties in the Thompson Belt that is only second to valet and up against valet in that belt. So it's incredible, incredible piece to Ken Alaska's story. Now, do we get value for that nickel portfolio? Probably not because we're a uranium focused explorer and project generator. That's our love. That's where our experience lies. That's what we want to do because we believe in what the world has for a dream. And that's electrification of the planet. It's got to be done with clean electricity generation. That's got to be a larger component of nuclear. New deposits have to be found. The Athabasca Basin is tier one country. It displaces everything around the world when you can find that 50 or 100 million pound deposit that you talk about. It displaces those in Africa or Australia or Asia, maybe not Kazakhstan. But the point is, when you find a big one in the Athabasca, it pushes all those aside and it becomes the front runner. That's what we're focused on. That's what we're after. So the trick for us moving forward is how to monetize the nickel for our Can Alaska shareholders because we've got an incredible nickel portfolio. And, um, and that's... Uh, that's, That's for free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, keep keep working on monetizing the nickel. Um, Absolutely. And I, um, what what would you say is the minimum economic size of a of a Athabasca style? Uh, let, let's say you have great success down the the, the Key Lake um, uh, extension. You know, yeah. can you? It, 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 you know, those will be relatively shallow. Is is thirty million pounds enough? You know, given that you've got the infrastructure. It's really I'm going really to be enough. bold, Merlin. I'm going to be bold, Merlin. I'm going to answer that because, um, you know, I think you have to be north of 100 million pounds, flat out, to start thinking of being a tier one deposit. That's just to think about it. You put 100 million pounds away from the mills, doesn't work. You put 100 million pounds around the mills, it starts to work. And I think that's one of the advantages that we have in our portfolio is that we've positioned ourselves with great assets for responding to our exploration up against the infrastructure. OK, up yeah. against the Key Lake Mill, the MacArthur Mine, the Cigar Lake Mine, uh, the McLean Lake Mill, even around uh, Eagle Point and the Rabbit Lake operation. So, you know, imagine a world in, you know, 15 years where you have no production from the eastern Athabasca. MacArthur River has 15 years of mine life left when it restarts. It doesn't have more reserves waiting. Cigar Lake has six or seven years left. It's currently producing. 
no production after that time. There's no other tier one assets in Eastern Athabasca that will fill these mills. And that's the beauty of our strategy, being up against that with projects that are expanding, with projects that are, ex that are responding to our exploration with signs of these tier one events. Not just mineralizing events, tier one events like a MacArthur cigar. And that's what has us excited. It's interesting that you, um, you put the figure at 100 million pounds because mm. they're, they're up to, you know, everybody wants to have a tier one um, deposit and that's great. But given that you've got the infrastructure there, is, are you saying that a 50 million pound deposit won't necessarily get built because of the permitting, because of the, the, the safety, because of the um, environmental aspects you've got to do, the decontamination and all that kind of stuff? Are you saying that it's, it, you, you kind of need to be up around 100 million pounds before it works? Why do I say that, Merlin? There are a lot of 50 million pound, even 100 million pound deposits in the Athabasca Basin, Eastern Athabasca Basin included that aren't tier one, they're tier two at best. They need, they need break even costs around $65 a pound roughly. And that's tier two sort of by definition. And that, that's global, you know, in that $65 a pound range. Tier one in the Athabasca is gonna be down around 30, $35 a pound. That pushes those out in time. In order to get there, you need to be north, I believe, need to be north of 100 million pounds and you need to be in and around the infrastructure. As soon as you get away from the infrastructure, you have to have a larger deposit, like 150, 200 million pound deposit to start thinking about it. So our advantage is being close to the infrastructure. One of the advantages we have is having a partner in Cameco at West MacArthur, where we have all the indications of a large system like a cigar in MacArthur right next door to their mine. And that mine will run out of around 15 years when it restarts. The Key Lake Mill is just down the road. That's where MacArthur Ore goes. We have an opportunity to feed that to our partner in Cameco at their Key Lake operation. Well, there we go. Nathan, over to you. 100 million pounds, please. Um, yeah, you can, we're you trying, can really, yeah. <laughs> you can check in later in the year. <laughs> Gents, thank you so much. It's been really interesting. Um, I think we're gonna have to leave it there. Uh, I look forward to, in particular, hearing about how the five holes go at uh, Waterbury South, if it is five holes. Um, and of course, MacArthur um, West, West MacArthur, and uh, looking forward to seeing how the, the, the nickel uh, monetization process goes during the course of the year. So good luck with everything and uh, hopefully speak to you at some stage in the future. Well, thank you, Merlin. It's been a real pleasure talking to you today. And, and uh, I hope you've learned a lot about Ken Alaska. So, you know, keep, keep watching. Thank you. Oh, will do. That's great. Thanks, Merlin. Thanks for having us on today.